Well, welcome to our online Bible study. That This is the weekend version. And we're calling this Current Events in Light of Biblical Prophecy. And today we're going to be looking at uh, a subject that, you know, you first read it and you're scratching your head and you're saying, what in the world are we talking about? Because we uh, just came off of a lesson that we were talking about a time for the sword. And now is a time to terrify and thrown down horns. So uh, this raises some question as to what we're talking about here. So we'll we'll get into this. So get your Bible and we'll turn to Zechariah chapter one. We're going to finish up chapter one today, maybe. And uh, let's get ready to dig deep into what the Word of God has to say. But as we begin, as we always do, let's open with prayer. Heavenly Father, we just want to bless and thank and praise your holy name. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for your many blessings that you give to us each and every day. Thank you for the opportunity that we have together, together in your name. Thank you for your word that is there to strengthen, encourage, and to teach and guide us. We just pray, Lord, that you would open up our hearts, our minds, our understanding, that we would draw close to you, that we would seek your face. Because most of all, you want us, you want all of us, you want our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. So, Lord, help us to seek you with all of our heart. And we just bless you. We want to thank you. We enter into your gates with thanksgiving. And into your courts with praise. We want to bless your holy name and to be thankful. For you are good. Your mercy endures forever and your truth to all generations. I just want to thank you, Lord, for who you are in my life. And I just pray that you would speak to our hearts, that you would encourage us, you would strengthen us, you would sustain us. I pray for your joy, your peace, your love your wisdom, your discernment, your understanding would just fill us now, Lord. You said where two or three are gathered in your name that you're there in the midst of them. So, Lord, we thank you for the two or three that are gathered here in your name. And we just know that if we agree together, if we can come together in unity, that you said, you promised that you would do what we ask. We just thank you, Lord, and we're just praying for our nation. We're praying for the situation that we're facing in the world. We know that we're living in turbulent times. Help us to understand the meaning of what is happening as it applies to the biblical prophecy. And we'll give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts, be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, because you are our strength and our Redeemer, and I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, if you got your Bibles, Zechariah chapter 1, verse 18. And then I lifted up my eyes, and I saw four horns. And I said to the angel speaking to me, What are these? And he answered, These are the horns that have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Then the Lord showed me four craftsmen. And I said, What are these coming to do? And he said, These are the horns that scattered Judah, after which no one could raise his head. And these four craftsmen have come to terrify and throw down the horns of the nation who have lifted up their horn against the land of Judah to scatter it. So these were the four horns that is speaking about here. And in biblical times, horns speak of the strength and the authority because the power of a bull or an ox is expressed through its horn. So here's what it's saying, that the horns are representative of a power 
uh, an authority, whether it's a nation, an empire, it's talking about those who uh, exert their authority over other people. Just wanted to show you what a horn of an animal looks like uh, when in the Bible in the Old Testament when they talked about blow the trumpet in Zion that's what they were talking about it was an animal's horn uh, that was used as a musical instrument um, I have a shofar I don't know if you can see it very well but it's one of the smaller ones but it's made out of uh, an animal's, I mean it's an animal's horn and uh, it can make musical sounds um, and you know we live in deer country we have deer hunters uh, we want those uh, those horns people use those as trophies but for the Jewish people these were the ram's horns and you see that some of those horns were huge and uh, they can make a very powerful sound when it's blown. So the horn of an animal, they saw, you know, these, these ram's horn, like I said, that was their power. That was their authority. That's how they defended themselves. That's how they attacked their enemies was through their horns. And um, like I say, they, they were big and uh, they can make a powerful sound as well when you use them as a musical instrument. Baldwin said, Horns, the pride of a young bull, are an obvious choice symbol to represent invincible strength. As trophies of the hunt, they represented conquest of strength. So Zechariah, who is a visionary, sees four horns in this vision and four craftsmen. We see horns mentioned uh, several times throughout the scripture and I just want to give you some flavor um, as far as what's found in the scripture. Here's 1 Samuel chapter 2 verse 10. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. Talking about the Lord. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his king, and exalt the horn of his anointed. So many times, uh, it was they used the horn to anoint, say, the king or a priest or a prophet. They would fill it up with the oil, and then they would anoint people for the calling that they had on their life. Uh, Daniel is another example. It says, I considered the horns. Now Daniel was another visionary and he saw ten horns in his vision 
And behold, there came up among them another little horn. Now this is talking about the Antichrist. This is talking about the Antichrist kingdom in the end of times. And this another little horn before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. So Zechariah was not the only one that had a vision of horns and how they represented power and authority. Now, this is what Zechariah wrote as part of his uh, vision. He said, these are the horns that have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. So, who are the horns that Zechariah is speaking about? Because if the horns represented, represent, uh, say, a political entity, a nation, or an empire, which ones are the ones that scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem? Well, if he's talking in a literal sense... These four horns could be, the four horns could be Assyria, Babylon, and the Medes and the Persians. I'm going to show you some maps here. You can see on the left hand side, this is showing you the map of Israel. It's just zooming in on this little territory in here. And at one point, the nation was united but then after the time of Solomon, after Solomon died, it was divided up between the north and the south. The northern kingdom became known as the kingdom of Israel. And you see it goes in the northern portion of the nation. And then the southern kingdom became known as Judah. Judah was two tribes. It was Judah and Benjamin. And, of course, the capital city of Jerusalem was also here. Now, Jerusalem was the capital of the United Kingdom before they split up. But after the split up between the north and the south, Jerusalem remained the capital of the southern kingdom of Judah. But for Israel, in 722 B.C., it was the Assyrians. Here is a map of the Assyrian Empire. What you see highlighted there is the Assyrian Empire. And you see that it's part of Iran. Um, yeah, Iran and Iraq and Syria. And then it goes down into Israel. So that was the Assyrian Empire. Uh, the Assyrians were noted as the original terrorists. This is where terrorism originated because they were very brutal. They had no compassion on people. Uh, they um, would terrorize people by the way that they treated their captives. And it was the Assyrians who captured the northern kingdom, the ten tribes of the northern kingdom of Israel. And they carried them away into captivity. And they brought their people from their territory and brought them into Israel to inhabit it. Now I'm sure there were some of the maybe poorest of the poor that remained in uh, the northern part, but they intermarried with the Assyrians. And that's why, you know, there was such prejudice against the Samaritans because they considered them a half-breed and that they had intermarried with the Assyrian. But the ten northern tribes became known as the ten lost tribes of Israel because they never came back. They never restored their kingdom. They never came back to restore the northern part of Israel. And then in 586, Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar of the Babylonians, now this is over a hundred years later, 
the Babylonians overtook the Assyrians and then they began to dominate the world at that time. And you see the highlighted area in your bottom right hand screen. You can see that um, their territory extended beyond the territory of the Assyrians. But King Nebuchadnezzar came in to Judah, the southern kingdom, Judah and Benjamin. And of course, you know, the, the tribe of Levi was scattered throughout all the tribes of Israel. So you had part of the Levites as well that were in the southern kingdom. And they were carried away into captivity into Babylon. So these were the nations that scattered Israel and Judah. But then along came um, the uh, uh, Persian Empire. And here is a map of the Persian Empire. And you see that their territory overtook whatever the Assyrian and the Babylonian Empire. It just swallowed them up as well as uh, according to the book of Esther, uh, the, the Persian Empire extended for 127 provinces all the way from India all the way down into Egypt. And you can see it even extended westward into um, Turkey and Macedonia. And they were trying to get into Greece, but when they did that, that was a big mistake. So they ran into Alexander the Great at that point. So the kingdoms of Israel and Judah had been swallowed up by these empires. They had been scattered. And remember that at the time that Zechariah is writing and seeing these visions, it's during the Persian Empire. Now, here's just a side note that uh, the Persians are now known as Iran. And they still have this in their history. They, have, they still have this in their memory that at one time they dominated the world. And so when you see that Iran is trying to take over in the Middle East, it's because they have in their memory, in their history books, we once dominated this area. And another side note is to remember that there is one Jewish queen of Persia, of Iran, and that was Queen Esther. And they still revere and honor and respect Esther even today, the people in Persia or Iran. They still revere her. But these are the entities, the political entities that scattered Israel, Judah, and Jerusalem. And remember that it was the Persian king that did allow the Jewish people, those that wanted to, it, it wasn't a forced thing, it was a voluntary thing, but those that wanted to go back and build the house of God in Jerusalem and to rebuild Judah, they were allowed to do it. But by this time, uh, 70 years later, 70 plus years later, there were not too many of the Jewish people that were willing after that length of time because they'd settled down, they'd built houses, they had established uh, their jobs, their businesses. Uh, so they were pretty well settled in the Persian Empire at that time. And so just a small percentage of the people wanted to go back and were willing to make the great sacrifice and to put forth the effort to try to restore their nation. So. Again, these are the entities historically that had scattered the Jewish people. <clears throat> now, in 
Zechariah's vision, he also sees craftsmen, four craftsmen. And what are they coming to do? They're coming to terrify them. Now, God raised up other nations to judge the nations that scattered his people. Uh, because, like I said, for the Assyrians, it was the Babylonians that came and overtook them and captured and took over their territory. It was the Medes and the Persians that took over the Babylonian Empire. And it was the Greek Empire. It was Alexander the Great and his government, his political entity that overtook the Persians. And then it was the Romans. So, you you know, God had a, a, a way of bringing judgment upon those that scattered his people. This is goes right along with the promise that God made to Abraham when he says, I'll bless those that bless you, and I'll curse those that curse you. So all the ones that cursed Israel and tried to uh, scatter Israel, they became scattered, so to speak. They had enemies that came along and overtook them as well. Now, in, again, in the scripture that we're studying today, it says to cast out the horns of the nations that lifted their horn against the land of Judah. So what does God promise? He promises to break the power of those political entities who have used their power against the Jewish people. So he raised up other powers to destroy the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Medes and the Persians, and then the Greeks, and then the Romans. And the Roman Empire existed, uh, at least the eastern leg of the Roman Empire existed until the modern times, all the way up into the 1900s. The uh, the Roman Empire existed, but like I said, here's an ancient proverb that puts it well. The church of God is an anvil that has worn out many hammers. In 2 Kings 24, 14, this is what it says. And this is when the Babylonians captured the southern kingdom of Judah. Notice that it said he carried away all Jerusalem and all the officials and all the mighty men of valor, 10,000 captives, and all the craftsmen and the smiths. None remained except the poorest people of the land. You know, I, you have to, uh, when you read the scripture, you need to zero in on the fact that why do they include certain things? Why do they leave certain things out? Why do they give certain details and then other details they don't? So, you know, it's understandable that um, the, the one that's pinning the words of Second Kings when it's talking about uh, the Babylonians and when they're coming in and taking over uh, to list the officials, the mighty men of valor, you could understand that they would want to document that. But then it goes on to say the craftsmen and the smiths. Why is it? Why are they included in this? Why was that significant in the scriptures? And then it goes on in verse 16, and the king of Babylon brought captive to Babylon all the men of valor, 17,000. I mean, sorry, 7,000. <clears> so the men of valor, okay, that's great. I mean, you would think so. Uh, if you're taking over a, a kingdom, if you're taking over a nation, yeah, you want to take the men of valor. You want to get rid of them. You don't want them coming against you. But then for it to go on to say the craftsmen and the metal workers, 1,000, all of them strong and fit for war. Again, to describe 
or to include the fact that the craftsmen and the metal workers, 1,000 of them, so there were 1,000 craftsmen and metal workers that were carried away captive into Babylon. So what are these coming to do? Looking at uh, Zechariah chapter 1, verse 21. And he said, These are the horns that scattered Judah, after which no one could raise his head. And these four craftsmen have come to terrify and throw down the horns of the nation who lifted up their horn against the land of Judah to scatter it. What are these four craftsmen come to do? To terrify and to throw down the horns of the nations? Craftsmen? Metal workers? They terrify the powers that be? And that's what it's saying here. It's saying those who have the uh, ability and are called by God to be the craftsmen, they are the ones that terrify the nations that have captured them. So what does this say to us? This says to us that <clears throat> those that have the ability to restore a nation, the craftsmen, they are the ones that are going to terrify. <clears throat> when at the time that Zechariah is writing this, it's those who have come back with their hammers and their saws and their chisels and their hammers and, and the ones that are the bricklayers and who can put the stones together and start rebuilding the walls that surround the city. These are the ones that were terrifying the people uh, that were in charge in that territory. They were looking at this and they said, wait, 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 wait. We had control of this territory before these guys came in and started rebuilding the nation. These are the ones that were terrifying those that had been in power. And they're saying, they're building their nation. We can't allow that. You know, Satan wants to kill and to steal and to destroy. And when he sees that there are people that are joining hand to hand, and during the time of Nehemiah, this is exactly what happened. As he had the people, the workmen, he said, you take what's right in front of your house, take your neighborhood, and start building the wall that's right in front, you know, in the property that's right in front of you, start putting the hammer together, the, the saw, the chisels, whatever it took to build that wall. Get the mortar and you build the wall that's right in front of your house. And this is what terrified the enemies of the Jews when they saw this happening. And they tried to intimidate, they tried to ridicule, they tried to sabotage, they tried to do everything in their power to stop the people, to discourage them, to keep them from rebuilding their nation. And that's what I see in America today. As we're trying to take back our nation, it's been chaotic as far as the political scene in this entire year. All the turmoil that is swirling around this political season, these campaigns, all the mudslinging, all the, um, all the disunity that we've seen within certain parties, it's because the enemy is terrified at the idea that we want to rebuild our nation. But you know it's not going to come from one person. <clears throat> yeah, it's good to have a leader. Because if, uh, if the sheep do not have a leader, then they're scattered and they don't know what to do. They need somebody to organize them and get them going in the right direction. But it's not going to be one person 
that's going to rebuild this nation if this nation is to be great again because there are forces, there are powers out there that want to destroy America. They want to destroy our greatness, our power. They're downside, downsizing our military. They're not equipping our military the way that they should. <clears throat> so politically, militarily, spiritually, morally, there are forces out there that is trying to just undermine the greatness of our nation. They want to promote a one world system, a one world government. They don't want us to have boundaries or borders anymore. But just as Israel, it was scattered among the four horns, America is, is at that point, maybe we haven't been carried away into captivity into a foreign land, but we're being torn apart. We're being, little by little, the walls that have surrounded us of protection, of security, has been chipped away at. And we've seen natural disasters. We see all these forces that is undermining the greatness of this nation. The moral fiber of this nation has been chipped away with. And the thing that's terrifying the enemy is for the church to arise, for the church to do its job, for the church to be the ones that are sounding the shofar, that is sounding the trumpet, and saying, we must arise, church. We must take our nation back. We were founded on certain principles and we need to start building our nation again and the greatness for which we stand. And I just pray uh, for this nation. I pray for the church because this is where it's going to start. Because as it says in Chronicles, if my people, that's talking about God's people, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. You know, in the church itself, wickedness has permeated. W wickedness has seeped its way into the church. We're now diluting the message of the gospel. We're m diluting the message that the Bible has. We're uh, turning away from the Bible. We're turning away from the biblical principles within the church. We need to turn from our wicked ways and stand on the Word of God and take those hammers and take those chisels and start building the wall. Build the wall around Jerusalem. Build the wall around our nation and say the, to the enemy, you are not allowed to take this land. Pray for America. It's the craftsman that's going to terrify the enemy. It's the craftsman that's going to chip away at the horns, the four horns, those that want to scatter us, those that want to take away the greatness of this nation, the greatness of the glory of God that has been within our nation. The greatness of being able to proclaim the gospel throughout the world. The nation of uh, the United States has been a beacon of hope and light to many people around the world as we have shown forth or shined forth the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I pray that we will unite together as a people and as a nation to bring back America, to restore her to her greatness. And our greatness comes from Almighty God. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would speak to each and every heart, that you would touch us in a special way, to know that we are the craftsmen 
We are the ones that can terrify the forces of evil and darkness that is in this world. But it's only as we use those tools that God has given us, that He's placed in our hands, the tools of the Word of God, the tools of building a great nation. I pray, Lord, that You would inspire us, encourage us, strengthen us to use our craft to destroy those horns that are trying to scatter us, trying to break us into pieces, trying to make us a pile of rubble. Forgive us, Lord, of our many sins and empower us to be your people. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen.